Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today um, for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to just jump right in. Uh, today's topic is all about 3D GIS and the modern city. Cities represent the big forces at play, economic forces, social forces, environmental forces. 3D is at the heart of an essential strategy for managing and planning your city. To help articulate this, we've invited two amazing guests that can show you some incredible work. My name is Brooks Patrick, and I work here on the 3D, te 3D team uh, at SRU's California office. And I'd like to start by sharing with you some of my experiences when traveling the world presenting SRU's 3D solutions. I've recognized three main recurring themes all over the world, from Beijing, China, to Gothenburg, Sweden, to Riverside, California. First and foremost of these common re recurring themes is the onset of global urbanization trends. Four years ago was a very special time for cities. It marked the first time ever that cities represent over 50% of the world's population. And because we're in the midst of urban rap rapid urbanization, uh, cities are going to have to be built fast. Um, it's really my hope that we're able to correct many of the mistakes that were made in the last 30 years. As China and India builds its cities, it can't just take the recipe from 20th century America and apply it to 21st century China or 21st century India. That would be horrible for them and horrible for all of us. Second are the pressing environmental challenges that are facing cities today, the eventualities of natural and man-made disasters. In fact, parallels between man-made systems such as the economy or the electricity grid and complex natural ones are bringing new ideas to strategic planning and risk management. This trend will have profound implications for policymakers and planning agencies alike uh, because re resilient communities begin with location awareness. And finally, third, is that meeting these demands are expected to be fast and efficient. Uh, what will our cities look like in 40 years' time? 3D GIS supports rapid design and implementation of new planning capabilities and climate resiliency strategies, at the same time improving the methods of communication towards accessible, uh, almost viral solutions. 3D drives better informed decisions by communicating ideas more effectively, by in essence telling a story. So you will of course draw your own conclusions today, but we will start to go over uh, some of the features to bring 3D GIS to your city. So during this webinar, we'll be featuring a series of questions. When the time comes, an interactive question will appear on the screen, giving you the ability to submit your answer. We'll tally the numbers in real time and share the results back with you. So the first question, have you ever used a 3D software? Pretty basic. Do we have any 3D software gurus out there? And yes, so we have about a 65% say yes, and about 36% say no. So let me jump right back into the presentation and introduce our first speaker today. Uh, Mike is coming to us from Rochester, New York. As GIS coordinator for the city, he is transforming Rochester's GIS into a modern enterprise system, capable of supporting future enterprise application development. Mike is also an industry leader in 3D GIS, modeling, analysis, and visualization. Today, he will be presenting an example from Rochester's Center City Master Plan, an amazing case of 3D urban design and master planning. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Ross. Uh, as Brooks mentioned, I'm the GIS coordinator for the city of Rochester, New York. Uh, Rochester is the third largest city in New York State. We're slightly smaller than Buffalo and obviously quite a bit smaller than New York City. Uh, Rochester is the hub of the Genesee Finger Lakes region of western New York, and the, the metro area has a little over a million people. Uh, as with many American cities, uh, sprawl and dis disinvestment over the past half century has caused us some challenges, but uh, things are turning around. There are some broad uh, social, cultural, economic, and demographic trends that are kind of coalescing to bring renewed energy to cities. Our downtown is growing. People are moving back. The downtown population is booming, buildings are being renovated, and we're putting in bike lanes and coffee shops. It's, it's an exciting time for our downtown. 
Uh, we have several major projects underway that are going to dramatically reshape our urban form. Uh, so for us, it made sense to have a 3D model in place uh, to help planners and stakeholders better understand the impact of these major projects. Uh, one of these projects is the Midtown site. Uh, this was the demolition of an obsolete shopping mall located right in the middle of downtown. Uh, we're reintroducing the street grid to the nine-acre site, uh, and we're creating uh, several shovel-ready parcels for development. Uh, another major project is filling in the inner loop. Um, Brooks mentioned the mistakes of the past, and this is definitely one of those. This thing is a dinosaur of a sunken expressway, and it effectively divides our downtown from the adjacent neighborhoods, and in some places with 10 to 12 lanes. Uh, this thing's ridiculous. It gets very little traffic. Nobody drives on it. Uh, it gets far less traffic than the surface streets. Uh, it's really just a barrier. These days, we think of it as a moat. So we're filling it in, bringing it up to grade, uh, adding cross streets, uh, building traffic calming measures, and we're going to be turning it into a pedestrian and bicycle friendly boulevard. Um, this will reconnect downtown to residential neighborhoods. Uh, and it's also going to open up almost the same amount of space for redevelopment as the Midtown project. So these are two really big projects. Um, they're also two very three-dimensional projects. Uh, and so we felt that we needed a way to be able to communicate these changes with stakeholders, uh, decision makers, and the, uh, and the public. Uh, another major factor in our decision to pursue a 3D model of our downtown uh, was the decennial, every 10-year master planning process that takes place uh, for municipalities in, in New York State. Our last plan was from 2003. Um, it was a pretty good plan, but it was a little outdated, and it was uh, an entirely 2D product. But urban cores kind of, by their nature, are three-dimensional spaces, right? Uh, and we really wanted the ability to review the old plan uh, in 3D. So we're going to take this old plan and kind of 3Dize it, make it a three-dimensional uh, scene. So we could take another look, take a second look at whether the massing and urban form recommendations from that previous plan uh, still made sense. Uh, so to do this, we engaged with Bergman Associates. Uh, Bergman is a local architect architecture, engineering, and planning firm. Uh, and they're an Esri business partner, and they're located right here in downtown Rochester. Uh, Bergman had a ton of experience in both GIS and in 3D visualization, uh, and we had them do some 3D GIS work for us. Uh, the first thing they did was to build an existing state 3D model of downtown. Uh, so this is the, um, uh, the geo-specific model, right? This is a, what is actually out there. Uh, they used uh, very detailed LIDAR-based terrain and photorealistic buildings. Um, we also wanted them to use City Engine uh, to build some geotypical modeling, so uh, things that are not really there but could be. <laughs> um, and. Uh, we, we wanted to take a look at the recommendations uh, in the 2003 master plan using City Engine. Um, and for this, we used our form based zoning code as inputs for the parametric modeling. Um, we also wanted to use the model to review some major projects uh, and some site plan review. Uh, so, uh, in cases where we had a major building uh, proposed for one of these new development sites, we wanted to be able to take a look at the proposed building's height and mass uh, kind of in context, in a 3D context, uh, to evaluate how that would affect the surrounding public spaces uh, and uh, the kind of the urban form uh, again. Um, and finally, uh, we really wanted to use the model to help with public engagement during stakeholder uh, meetings. Uh, so we have a demo now. We're going to take a look at a uh, web scene uh, that we put together uh, showing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the old uh, plan uh, made into a 3D uh, model. So um, at some point in your career, if you're like me, you've described GIS using the, the cliched old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and that's true, because it, it's our business as GIS professionals to use GIS to make uh, very complex spatial information uh, easy to understand through maps uh, for a kind of a lay audience. Um, in master planning maps, we take really complex demographic, economic, and cultural data to create a, a kind of a total picture of the community's vision for smart, sustainable growth. Uh, but the reality is we, of course, don't live in pictures, uh, especially not 2D pictures, but in a really rich three-dimensional world. Um, and so uh, if a picture is worth a thousand wor words, a, a 3D scene is worth a million words. Um, when we were looking to update our Center City Master Plan, we looked for an intelligent map to kind of guide and promote the update process. Um, we wanted to uh, look at some things like updating the zoning code, um, community education, uh, maybe promoting opportunities for development. And for me, the, the 
real value of this interactive map uh, became very clear um, at a, a city-hosted kickoff meeting that we held with uh, planning professionals and downtown stakeholders, uh, developers, and, and uh, people like that, architects. Um, being able to kind of fly, pan, and zoom to locations that were being discussed during that discussion was incredibly valuable. So with the 3D scene projected on the wall, whenever we would talk about a specific building uh, and people's hopes and dreams for that area, uh, transitional property, a public space, any of those kind of things, we would uh, pan and zoom the map to that location and kind of virtually place the participants at the site. It was really helpful because it gave everyone a shared experience and understanding the space and the, the context and the plan. Um, so uh, we also uh, built uh, these uh, um, geotypical models using city engine. Uh, so uh, we took our uh, form-based zoning code, right, uh, and we did 3D parametric modeling on it. Uh, parametric means rule-based. Um, we don't regulate uses in our downtown so much uh, as we do the form and the shape of the buildings. We don't say uh, this area is residential and this area is commercial. It's all mixed together. It's a mixed-use environment, right? Um, so what, what we do is say, okay, you have to build the building straight up to the sidewalk. Uh, you have to have windows on the first floor. Um, the inside of the building has to be visible from the sidewalk. We, do, we have all these rules that help uh, guide people into building uh, structures that enhance the pedestrian environment and enhance our downtown. Um, now, traditionally, these codes are defined in text and in uh, simple sketch renderings, but even that can be hard for, for even professionals to understand. So being able to see what this looks like in 3D is really a huge uh, uh, improvement. Um, so now we have uh, a second uh, little demo here on my other tab. Um, so the 3D model supports that master plan update process through parametric modeling, uh, which helps us really understand the zoning code better and understand the plan better. Um, but it also brings an incredible amount of value to other uh, planning needs, such as site plan review. Now, this is when we're talking about a specific site. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, models of the uh, Windstream uh, headquarters building uh, in the Midtown site. Um, this was a building where they reused some of the steel structure from an existing building, uh, and we have um, uh, some other potential buildings in there too. Um, this is really cool. We can do things like uh, shadow analysis. What impact do these buildings have on uh, the shadows on the street and the other buildings? Uh, that's that's uh, pretty important. Um, and uh, we, we can just kind of get a feel for how that building is going to relate to its, uh, to its immediate um, environment. So um, as we finalize our master plan update, the, the web-enabled GIS has proven a really powerful tool to guide and uh, portray a, a vision for our growth for the future. Um, so on this next uh, slide, we've got uh, next steps for us. Uh, we are looking at um, uh, using this 3D content that we've got uh, and uh, allowing more people to access it. So how are we going to do that? Well, um, uh, we've got a lot of 3D content here. We've got uh, on the bottom of this stack of layers, we've got our terrain model. Uh, we have um, uh, orthophotography that's draped over the, the terrain. Uh, we have uh, in the middle of this stack of layers our um, uh, our as uh, our, our as existing models, our, our geospecific models. Um, above that, we can drape uh, plans or other documents on top of it. And then finally, on the top of that stack, you see the the uh, city engine buildings, the geotypical uh, models from our form-based uh, zoning. So. Uh, we want to put all of this uh, into ArcGIS server and uh, publish that um, as a 3D base map uh, for internal use uh, in ArcGIS uh, for professionals. And that's Esri's uh, upcoming desktop application that has both native and 2D, 2D and 3D capabilities. Uh, and we also want to continue to use this to generate web scenes for meetings, uh, stakeholder engagement, and, and public engagement. Uh, and I think that, uh, Brooks, you, you're going to present uh, some more information on ArcGIS Professional and 3D Services later in this presentation. So I will hand it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And yeah, I'll do a demo of uh, ArcGIS Pro, uh, just getting started, uh, definitely, later in the presentation. Um, before moving on, uh, we'd really like to know your thoughts. Uh, so I'll launch one more poll here, um, really asking, did this last example resonate with you? Uh, please take a moment and just uh, file in your answer. and overwhelming yes so great great work um, coming from the city of Rochester uh, for sure so now moving forward 
uh, let's dive into a couple more great examples from around the world. During this year's ESRI User Conference, the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore demonstrated how 3D GIS is crucial for, as an urban planning tool uh, for one of the most densely populated countries in the world. They recognize that the future comprehensive plan will be data hungry. So we really have to ask, how do we start to visualize this data? But furthermore, how do we start to work with this data and format environmental economic constraints? I mean, you can see here in the video that the URA was able to implement city engine rule-driven models within their planned constraints, like this lake shed, uh, lakeside view shed. Uh, the buildings are able to actually adapt on the fly, enabling a flexible 3D design environment. Another great example comes to us from Sweden. The city of Gothenburg is constantly changing, and the city architects needed a way to sketch in 3D in real time. Traditional modeling wasn't viable because it was labor intensive, and by next week that, that model was old. With City Engine's procedural rule driven modeling, they were able to visualize Gothenburg in 10 or even 20 years and update the model in real time on a weekly basis as they met with the different city planning authorities. From the total model, they were also able to create a 3D printed version that is now being featured at over a dozen events this year. The physical model proved to be a highly effective method of getting public feedback. Now jumping across the ocean uh, to the state of Oregon. The facilities planning unit is part of the state's CFO office and is responsible for managing the budgeting process for state-owned and leased facilities. The goal for the state was to achieve a shared and common 3D view of their facilities uh, that they could then use to support their 10-year facility planning process as well as the state's biennial capital budgeting process. Moving now down the coast, we find another great example coming from nearby San Francisco. The Bay Area Rapid Transit, BART, was looking for a way to communicate transit-oriented development plans both internally and to the public. BART also recognized the efficiency and impact that can be achieved by communicating their plans in 3D. BART is working with ESRI professional services to further define their 3D modeling process using the Richmond station as a prototype. This project laid the groundwork for how BART can move forward with modeling all 44 stations in 3D, really to better communicate the development plans for areas surrounding each station. The city of Rochester also chose to engage a partner, Bergman Associates, to help implement their 3D strategy. Our second guest today, Eric Brady, is going to dive a little deeper into the flexible tools that enabled the city of Rochester. Thanks, Brooks. Hello, everyone. So when Rochester came to us and asked if we could model out the master plan's proposed development, uh, we saw it as a real challenge. And the intention was that these models were to represent the spirit of the city's vision for growth, the scale, density, and general architectural style allowed by the city's form-based code. Uh, it would have been a real significant effort to hand model each of those buildings, and the back and forth nature of defining these criteria would have meant uh, significant rework with changes. So we saw City Engine's parametric modeling as a, a way to effectively create representative models while offering easy control over mass changes. We identified some key zoning code attributes to be represented by the models, uh, such as height, setback, roof style, uh, glazing coverage, which is the percent of uh, windows, and the facade material. So as we worked with the city and reviewed and refined these models, we could quickly react to city feedback with small changes in the CGA code uh, and make updates across the entire base map. Parametric models became a very effective tool for modeling the master plan's form-based zoning criteria within the existing 3D base map. For us, um, parametric modeling um, in the, used in Rochester uh, proved City Engine's power as a, a really powerful urban design and planning tool. Uh, and we're very interested in real-time analytics to support the planning uh, public process. So we're working with City Engine CGA scripting to create tools to support uh, this public shred process. For instance, a common zoning constraint is floor area ratio, meaning that the mass of a structure can be no more than the mass of a one-story building covering an entire parcel. But of course, setback, parking, and other aesthetic requirements limit this type of architecture, so alternative designs must be evaluated against these constraints. 
We developed a simple CGA rule that allows users to work with various setback and height configurations while outputting a FAR score. Similarly, we're developing tools to understand how glazing uh, coverage would look relative to zoning requirements. We believe having these types of tools available for immediate analysis and feedback uh, improves the public planning process by educating stakeholders on how specific zoning constraints will look and feel within their communities. And we've talked a lot about urban use cases for 3D GIS, but they're just as applicable to campus environments. Many universities have their own architectural constraints and space use challenges. We're working with our higher education clients using 3D GIS to support the same processes of understanding a campus's built environment and proposed development. So the model we're looking at now uh, was developed for the University of Rochester, uh, not too far from the downtown core, to show what new, uh, new proposed academic building would look like on the campus. So as iterative designs were developed by the architects, those models were in integrated into the 3D campus base map and evaluated uh, to look at the physical footprint and the visual synergy of the proposed building uh, within that, within the existing campus. And the 3D base map also supported numerous line of sight analysis, including review of a large proposed electrical substation that was to be built just off the campus. And this created concerns uh, with the campus planners just how the visual impact would be uh, on the campus. So using desktop GIS line of sight tools, we were able to quickly calculate the substation's view shed and confirm that this proposed station would have minimal visual impact. This allowed the utility to move forward constructing the station without much delay uh, that would have been involved in a more comprehensive review and it helped the campus planners understand uh, that there would not be this visual impact. But it's a great example of how having a 3D base map, uh, which was originally uh, designed for a planning purpose, can be leveraged for many more analysis. And as we talk about urban design and sustainable growth, 3D GIS goes beyond just visualizing the exteriors of buildings uh, and allows us to understand how space is used. An important driver in urban design is to maximize the interconnectivity and the use of physical space. City planners want to ensure that existing buildings are being used to their full potential and that any new development meets a location's need for space and use types. 3D GIS as a facility management tool offers the ability to visualize space uh, and support space management. And these data help portray what types of new development are needed and can be supported in a neighborhood, which ultimately help influence that decision-making process to help create dynamic and vibrant communities. So today at Bergman, um, all of our planning projects involve significant 3D GIS components, and we're actively building 3D base maps and analytic tools for communities and organizations uh, who recognize the benefit the models and tools offer to the planning process. And as we look to the future, we strongly believe that 3D GIS will become a key tool in the development and the delivery of master plans. What's really exciting for us is the rapid advancement and maturing of 3D technology, uh, as well as the planning profession's recognition and embrace of its potential. We fully anticipate that 3D GIS cities will quickly become a common and powerful GIS data set. Thanks a lot, Eric. Um, that's really nice work. Um, we're always jealous here at ESRI of, of all the nice work Bergman's doing with our, with our web scene uh, viewers. Um, before moving on, uh, we'd like to hear from our attendees. Um, so I'll launch one more poll and go ahead and uh, answer. Do you have the data expertise and resources to solve a problem uh, for your organization using 3D GIS? Um, we've really seen some amazing examples. Um, but does your organization have someone who already works with a 3D software? So take a moment and reply. All right, so it seems we have a lot of attendees here with uh, no data and no real expertise in 3D. Um, so again, uh, engaging with a partner is a great way to actually get started um, initially. So moving on, uh, we've really talked about some of the major themes that are taking 3D GIS into the city. I now want to focus on, on how 3D is integrated into the actual product. ArcGIS supports the enterprise by really supporting and connecting multiple communities across the platform. 
ArcGIS for desktop is made up of many familiar members like ArcGlobe, ArcScene, and City Engine. At the 10.3 release, there will be new app, a new application added to this product family called ArcGIS Pro. We're really taking the best of map, catalog, globe, and scene and really fusing them into one uh, application. We really expect the professional GIS workstation not to be the same old single monitor, but reality, in reality, a multi-monitor or even video wall configuration to use this application and its tearaway views um, that can actually be touch enabled as well. So ArcGIS Pro is the next generation ArcGIS desktop application for the GIS community who needs a clean, comprehensive user experience, which is incredibly fast and efficient, and that will increase productivity for integrated 2D and 3D workflows, supporting not only visualization, um, but data management and spatial analysis. In addition to that, being a desktop user, you also have access to ArcGIS Online and all the amazing content and apps associated with it. ArcGIS is an integrated system. It's not just the pieces, although you can think of it as pieces, the desktop, the server, the online piece. What it really is is an integrated system. It's interdependent, and ArcGIS Pro takes full advantage of this. So allow me now to take you inside of ArcGIS Pro and show you how easy it is to transform your existing 2D data into a 3D city model. I'm going to go ahead and launch the application here. So after we transform that 2D data, I'm also going to show you how we can start to ask questions and perform analysis on this rich 3D content that we generate. And I should mention before we get started, being a desktop user actually gives you access to all of this. So take advantage of it. I, I really wanted to make that point before jumping into the demo. Um, what we see here is actually a pre-release version of the 10.3 uh, release coming up. So if you want to join in the beta community, uh, there's rich discussions going on, and it really helps us here at ESRI, uh, informs us how best to move forward with the development of such a powerful application. So what you'll notice right off the bat is ArcGIS Pro is fast. Um, it's modern. Uh, it's a powerful application that can really transform the way we do GIS. Um, today we're going to take a look at the new 3D mapping capabilities it offers, as well as an amazing case of 3D urban analysis. So now to get started, what are some of the things that we need from any software to solve a problem? Usability and performance. Uh, and the first thing you'll notice about Pro is this modern ribbon interface, making it easy to find the commands you need. Um, it gives you access to familiar tools like adding a base map, um, also adding data, um, and there's the analysis tool bar, right? So rather than have uh, a window, we actually can embed these tools uh, right in the top, uh, and these can actually be customized to reflect only the tools you use on a daily basis, right? So these interface windows actually are dockable as well. So you can hide them, show them as needed, um, both the viewport and the windows. So Pro really gives you the performance you've been looking for. It's a powerful app. And this new display engine supports both 2D and 3D environments. Uh, you can work with multiple maps uh, in your projects, whether it's 2D or 3D, um, global or local. So here I'm actually going to launch a new map. And as it creates my new scene, I would just like to mention a discussion that I tend to have over 3D maps, uh, over the types of 3D environments. So as it finishes loading here, you see uh, the default will be a globe scene. Uh, the globe scene is similar to our globe, and this is where we have the curvature of the Earth, one coordinate system, uh, a truly global context and scale. Whether it's shipping lanes that go around the planet or an environmental effect, such as the jet stream, um, this would be the right 3D map to choose. However, by navigating to the View tab, we can also choose a local scene, transforming this uh, global scene into uh, something that would be similar to what you'd find in City Engine or Arc Scene. Um, you know, this is used to work primarily within an area of interest. Uh, many times, this can resemble a piece that has been chopped out. Um, you can move around it, under it, uh, and under it rather easily. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is the local scene can actually have a projected coordinate system, any coordinate system, while the global scene can't necessarily.
So Pro takes advantage of your GPU uh, so that you can rapidly roam and explore your maps. Um, the application also helps you by being more productive. Um, it doesn't make you wait while the uh, viewport finishes refreshing. Uh, the UI actually stays responsive, so that's that's the 64-bit um, application um, uh, features for you, right? So we can actually uh, operate in 2D and 3D at the same time um, for monitoring different areas. So I can actually uh, dock this 3D map as a vertical tab uh, next to my 2D, right? And so we're looking here at San Diego. Um, if I wanted to navigate, say, in my 2D and have it represented over there in 3D, um, I can actually go to View and link the views. Um, I can actually link uh, both the center point and the scale. So as I zoom in, it'll actually zoom in on my 3D as well. So over, the overall framework allows you to take advantage of most multiple desktop monitors. Uh, these different windows can be spread out on as many desktop monitors as your hardware can handle. Um, so now let's dig in a little deeper and show how Pro can transform your 3D workflows. Um, this is a relatively simple scene here, which I'll dock. Um, it's basically terrain and imagery, um, but with Pro you can actually transform your 2D data to 3D. So let's go ahead and add some data. Um, the project window uh, gives you easy access to all the resources in your project. So things like maps, tools, uh, and even links to your server uh, and ArcGIS Online accounts, right, um, or your portal. Um, so since we've already uh, added some buildings and, and trees uh, to this map here, uh, we can actually just highlight the, the layers we want, copy and literally paste it into our new scene. Uh, it's, it's really that easy. Alternatively, you could drag and drop from your contents folder. So you might notice that we only see a base map. Um, this is because some of the data might be using a default absolute height rather than our ground as the starting elevation. So we can go ahead and jump into that layer and actually tell it to sit on the ground, right? The first thing you generally have in a 3D map is a surface. Um, most of the time, that's the ground, uh, really a primary surface that things sit on top of. Um, my trees sit on the ground, um, my aerial imagery sits on the ground, and here we can actually project our building footprints on the ground, etc. Um, absolute height is primarily used for features that know their elevation, such as airplanes, for example, that know their own Z, um, the altitude. <laughs> So uh, as we assign the ground elevation, uh, the layers appear. Um, and I'd really like to stop here and just point out that many communities uh, don't have very complex 3D models. They have data like this. Um, and you'll notice that the layers that we copied in are actually under the 2D layers group here. Uh, this basically rasterizes and projects your features to the terrain. Um, what we really need to do is drag our buildings and trees to the 3D layers group, uh, which actually enables the vector version of those same features. So Pro supports both basic feature extrusion capabilities and the ability to run a City Engine RPK. A, an RPK is short for rule package, um, which is the shared format for City Engine rule files uh, that we saw earlier uh, when Eric was presenting um, these nice form-based uh, rules. Uh, these are really great for complex 3D symbols. So we can actually go ahead and apply a City Engine RPK to our trees. So as I select the symbol, it actually opens up the symbol window. And under Properties, I'll choose this little wrench here and actually add a procedural layer uh, to that symbol. I can actually delete all the other layers. And what you're doing is actually arranging uh, the capabilities within that symbol, all of the different drawing layers. Uh, here, when we go back to the actual layers, uh, all that's left is the procedural layer. We can actually browse for the rule file. Uh, in this case, we'll use a plant loader that we made from City Engine. Um, what we can do then is actually link to uh, existing data that might be on that uh, tree point. So let's go ahead and link our name field to the corresponding symbol name on the feature. Uh, this is literally matching up the attributes. Uh, within the rule and the data set. 
and once we link it we can hit apply and we'll see trees start to uh, populate our scene. Uh, so do bear in mind these are thousands of trees uh, and genus and specific uh, genus and species specific models, right? So those California palms are going straight down the boulevard in San Francisco and San Diego. For our buildings, we can use a simple expression in the extrusion symbology. So if I just highlight my layer, you'll see a new grouping up here in the ribbon. If I click on appearance, we'll see the extrusion. Uh, window here. We can do base height. Then I'll just enter in a quick uh, expression. I know my data is in meters and I want it to extrude uh, in feet. So this will give us a basic level of one detail scene. Uh, a single height attribute either from a floor count or derived from LIDAR is really all you need. Um, but now I'll open up another scene here and show you what's really possible from here. So we'll wait a, just a second while this loads. And so what we've done here is actually use an RPK for our buildings. Um, we can do some pretty cool things like subdivide the floors and even texture um, the buildings. Procedural layers also support multiple views of the same data. So we can link to a usage attribute and even drive the cartographic theme here. So we'll go ahead and hit apply, and that's actually going to rerun the rule and regenerate our buildings. And what you'll see is actually the usage as a color on the 3D content. Now, there are actually some vendors out there um, that offer this type of rich content, such as PLW, uh, Precision Lightworks. Um, they provide very accurate geometry, um, and RPKs these little rules can actually be applied to these existing models as well, um, actually giving you many more possibilities for using them cartographically inside of your 3D map. Oblique imagery can also be used to make a model look amazing and realistic, like you see here. And what you'll notice is in Pro, all of the geometry and textures in the scene are cached, allowing you to navigate very smoothly through your scene no matter really how large it is. So creating this 3D base scene is really the first step in going 3D. Um, now we're really able to explore different uh, symbology and labeling capabilities to 3D enable your existing 2D map layers. Uh, so we can actually turn on San Diego shortlist. Um, if you've been to the UC, you might have seen this web map. Um, and again, yeah, I just said it. It's actually coming from a web map. Um, these series of layers um, are actually a, f a feature service hosted on ArcGIS Online, streaming down into my desktop, and then I've actually symbolized those 2D layers with 3D symbols. Uh, so as that web map and that feature service gets updated um, by uh, the kind gentleman who ever made this, um, it'll actually update in my uh, 3D demo here. This kind of 3D mapping is also ideal for visualizing underground features, such as utilities. Utility agencies need to see the relationship between the underground networks and the features above. And furthermore, using the tree RPK that we're, we're using, uh, we can even enable uh, a generation of root growth volumes um, based on the species and age of the tree. So I'm going to go back into my parameters here, which I can actually change manually, just like in City Engine. I can enable root, root volume, uh, hit apply, and that's actually going to generate unique root volumes uh, for all of my trees within the city. And what we're doing here is actually using public data sets. So you too can actually uh, do this. Um, but this is fascinating for, for uh, public works. Being able to compare you know, the, the type of pipe to the surrounding conditions is really key. Uh, it's also big for the development review process. So multiple building scenarios can easily be handed over by the architect and dropped into our base scene, like you see here. Um, we can then really start to gauge the design 
within the larger context of the city, um, even best, better estimate potential tax revenue uh, as it relates to public infrastructure costs. Um, pretty powerful stuff. I'm sure you can see how this type of 3D modeling brings some amazing new capabilities and opportunities. In addition to fast 3D modeling, ArcGIS Pro supports 3D analysis. So for this example, I'd really like to take you to one of the densest cities in the world, Hong Kong. Uh, the Hong Kong Housing Authority uh, is responsible for administering the city's public housing program. Uh, the agency actively uses ArcGIS in their development review process. So let's navigate over um, to Hong Kong and you'll see uh, a small site uh, just northwest of the Kowloon uh, district. Kowloon. Um, this is actually the central business district of the city. So I'll go ahead and change my base map to imagery and you can better see the actual uh, urban growth that goes on around these very steep mountains. Let's zoom into that site here. And what you'll notice is actually a actual piece of terrain and imagery that has much higher resolution than our terrain and imagery services that are running in the background. You can actually burn this higher resolution uh, imagery into our service and use that within this 3D environment. So when siting a new building, it's important to take into account uh, the impact on the surrounding context. Um, with Pro, we can start to import drawing layers that matter most during the review process, such as CAD, CAD layers. That can be used for snapping, right? Uh, and we can even take in a tree, a site tree inventory, which you see here as they generate, uh, using that same rule that we were generating them with earlier. Now, well, because that, those trees are actually driven by that same RPK, we can go into that RPK and even change the representation of those trees. I mean, we're less interested in how they look uh, and really more interested in uh, the actual volume of the canopy and how that uh, is actually shading the site. And furthermore, using our imagery tools, we're able to extract out the approximate location of trees within the entire neighborhood and even randomize the placement of four distinct species that we knew native knew that natively grew to Hong Kong. Um, and like most modern cities, Hong Kong recognizes the importance of accessible open space for its residents year-round. However, if you've ever been to Hong Kong in the summer, you know the importance of a nice shade tree. Um, by taking into account the terrain, buildings, and trees, along with the seasonality of the tree canopy, we can start to estimate things like solar radiation on the surface. And we'll be able to actually run this uh, for each season of the year. Uh, spring versus summer, and then you'll see it actually uh, pan off with lower gains in the winter months. I mean, this is huge for actually analyzing the existing conditions of a site. This means the landscape architect can actually maximize the shade in the summer and maximize the exposure through the winter months, effectively optimizing the human habitat outside. When a building proposal is ready for the site, um, a, new, a, new, a new analysis can actually be run. So if we drop these buildings in here and rerun the analysis, we can see that down here to the south of the building, there's a little bit more exposure uh, than towards the rear of the building, uh, shaded in blue. So by combining solar radiation analysis with viewshed impact, alternatives can be compared. So we can drop in some new buildings, rerun the analysis, and see how that changes the environment. And you can see there's a lot more uh, shading going on behind the building here uh, during the springtime months. By combining 3D modeling and analysis, uh, we really get an understanding of site conditions uh, like never before. It's really essential for understanding uh, the overall conditions of an entire neighborhood, um, allowing us to better measure the impact of urban decisions and interventions, right? So with that, I'm going to actually jump back to the PowerPoint. Now, allow me a moment to discuss Esri's vision for the future of 3D GIS. 
as GIS users, we solve problems. That's the core of what we do. Um, we can effectively make more out of 3D than a simple visual. We've seen some powerful desktop applications today, City Engine and ArcGIS Pro, giving us fast, modern, and powerful tools that support current workflows and even transform the way you do GIS. However, there is also a demand to make 3D more available, more accessible across web browsers in the form of web scenes and even mobile devices through 3D-enabled applications, and then even back into desktop applications. Desktop is more than what was shown here. I want to emphasize that it now includes, as of last summer, ArcGIS Online. So all desktop users have a full subscription to ArcGIS Online, the cloud-based system. And what that means is you have the ability uh, to really have unlimited web mapping capabilities. You can author a map, send it to the cloud, and publish it for internal use or out to the public. Um, GIS is really evolving, and I'm sure everyone here is aware of the amazing new apps that are now available. To be able to use information products to support decisions, you need to be able to share them. Uh, you can share your content as packages, web maps, web layers, and 3D web scenes like you've seen earlier in the presentation. Um, apps have also become effective ways of sharing your authoritative content. Um, we're extending the ArcGIS data model to actually include scene services. Um, a scene service you can almost think of as uh, similar to a feature service. Uh, it's a shareable service um, that drives unlike a feature service, um, 3D content, right? So we can actually take your 3D content, create a service, and these services we see um, really enabling next generation app development. In the past, creating a 3D cityscape was an expensive and manual process. And as your city grows and changes, these hand-built models are quickly out of date. Uh, if you even took the, the chance to try and model this much um, content. Um, we can really now rapidly accelerate this process and make use of 3D content like never before. It comes down to having an overall 3D strategy for bringing the features that we've talked about today of 3D GIS to your organization. And we really see this happening in three distinct steps. Uh, step one, really evaluating your data and importing your data, uh, knowing what you have to get started. Step two, building this into a manageable, shareable 3D city model, a base scene, something initially created sometimes with the help of a partner like we've seen today. And finally, it's important to have a clear use case in mind when going through these steps. Uh, 3D GIS isn't just about seeing in 3D, it's really about understanding. And once this 3D city model is built out, it's possible to leverage it further within different departments for different use cases. So with that being said, I'd like to take a moment and hear once again from our attendees. So what data do you have to get started in 3D? Uh, here you're able to actually choose more than one answer, um, but please take a moment and choose all that apply. So basically, if you have LiDAR data, uh, we can extract footprints. If you have footprints and tree points, we can extract height from LiDAR. And if you already have high-resolution 3D models and you're pretty much ahead of the game, and this new technology really gives you a number of new ways to further leverage this content within 3D cartographic mapping. OK, great. Thank you for your responses. Um, it looks like we have about 80% of the attendees with building footprints. That's really great because we really see building footprints as uh, the first step in really going 3D. So we'd really like to now open it up for questions um, to all of our attendees. Um, please go ahead and either use the question window in our GoToWebinar or send us a tweet, um, SRE3D, hashtag SRE3D on Twitter. And if you don't get your question answered today, um, please just drop me an email. Um, my email will be on the next slide as well. Um, we'd be glad to uh, uh, work with you. So uh, Eric and Mike, if you don't mind joining us back again, um, we see some questions coming in. And while they come in, I'm actually going to start with a question from our last session that was really great. Um, 
uh, we actually didn't really cover it uh, in the presentation. And I'd like to pose it to you, Eric. Um, what was the real timeline for a project like the City of Rochester? Uh, hey, Brooks. Um, you know, the Rochester uh, project was very unique because we started it before City Engine, and uh, there was significant effort in building the data. Uh, but once um, City Engine came online, we really were able to streamline the process. So today, with the tools available and with uh, some great support for, from data vendors and a lot of these rule packages available for use, um, if the data is available, um, such as a good terrain and you know, building footprints and other supporting GIS data sets, you're, you're probably looking at two to four months to develop a, a scene of that scale to support your, your common planning needs that we uh, discussed today. Right, and and you guys actually go on site as well and um, do training sessions. Is right? Am I right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, City Engine's um, uh, a sophisticated piece of software, a lot of capability, and so what we do is, uh, on top of building 3D base maps, we'll go in and uh, help our clients uh, build some internal capacity to uh, work with the tools themselves and kind of take the the data and the product and run with it. Okay, great. Uh, so we have one question coming in. Can you do a drive-through animation using this? Um, all of our software uh, supports bookmarks. Um, what we do in ArcGIS Pro and, and in City Engine is really model and analyze and get those questions. If, if we want to truly visualize it um, past just the bookmarking capability, we really look towards a web scene or one of these different export options, even a game engine, to really uh, immerse the viewer within that 3D environment. Um, I should say that type of animation, that quality of animation, does require some pretty nice content. Um, so do keep this in mind. Uh, so we have some more questions here. Um, let's see. All right. So what platforms uh, support the current web scenes? Um, actually, the big three are supported. Um, Android, Windows, and just recently, as of about a month ago, the new iOS um, now supports WebGL. So you can open up one of these uh, web scenes on your iPad. Um, the size of a current web scene uh, will still matter. So I wouldn't try and run a larger web scene on a small iPhone. Um, but really, with the upcoming release of the 3D scene services, um, both uh, fueling uh, web applications, but also apps uh, through the JavaScript API, we really envision the same performance and capability you see with our 2D maps coming to 3D on all devices. All right, and one more question coming in. Uh, really talking about the effort um, behind uh, the 3D work we're doing. So how to use the technology, uh, how much training is needed uh, to work with a software like City Engine. Um, Mike, you probably have the most experience with this, uh, if you'd care to comment. Uh, sure. So um, City Engine does have a bit of a learning curve. Uh, it, it, it's a It's a very powerful and very complex piece of software. Um, so I wouldn't expect that you could uh, uh, pick it up and immediately uh, begin uh, modeling uh, cities with it. Um, you're going to have to spend some time learning uh, how uh, three-dimensional shapes are represented, uh, learning the, the CGA uh, code that, um, that describes uh, those 3D shapes, and figuring out what uh, parameters you want to use um, uh, as, as rules in City Engine. Um, and uh, it, 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 it'll take you a little while to, to get it going. Um, but once you do, um, it is much faster uh, to use than trying to model um, uh, every single building. Uh, and you really get some economies of scale. Um, if you're just modeling one building, then it might make more sense to use um, uh, 3D Studio Max or uh, even SketchUp or something like that just to do a single building. That You wouldn't want to develop rules for that. But if you're going to be modeling a large area and you have thousands of buildings to do, uh, then it really makes sense to figure out uh, the rule-based modeling so you can just cr uh, crank out a whole city or, or large uh, areas with it. So, yeah, it, it's you're going to spend some time learning to use it in the beginning, uh, but it will save you a lot of time on the back end, especially if you have uh, changes that need to be applied en masse to all of these uh, structures. Right, and yeah, so what we're talking about really here is scale. Um, taking a, a BIM model and trying uh, to use this uh, in sort of the context of a neighborhood is difficult without a GIS software to actually give you that managing platform to bring in all of this uh, highly detailed content. 
Um, but with, with that being said, I see a question here really about training. So is there City Engine or ArcGIS Pro training material available? Um, and the answer is definitely yes. We have a few different resources available, uh, including a YouTube channel, um, ArcGIS Resource Center, uh, and the ESRI training resources. Um, we recently uh, just released a series of new essential skills tutorials that I recommend checking out uh, on our YouTube doc, uh, youtube.com slash city engine. Um, these are free and they come with a project to help you get started um, with really building your first 3D city model. It's actually Redlands, California, so you get to build the, the little town uh, right next to the headquarters of Essary. Um, if you'd also like to have a hard copy of the training material, um, we typically give these out during our workshops. Uh, just feel free to drop me an email uh, and I'll just make that available to you. Um, my email will also be on the last slide today. Um, Esri also has City Engine jump starts available as well. Um, this is really a three-day fast track for cities uh, using their existing data. Uh, they've been highly successful, uh, like you've seen with the BART and with Singapore. Um, this really includes not only training, but the output, uh, essentially each participant uh, modeling a location within the overall uh, 3D city model in much greater detail towards a use case like development review. So you get uh, a lot of nice output as well. Um, and uh, we'll actually take one last question. I'm sorry if we didn't get to everything. Um, will a copy of this presentation be made available? Um, yes, uh, we'll definitely have that up and we'll send it out to everyone uh, after the webinar. So thank you very much for the questions. Uh, overall, great discussion. Um, before you go, I'd just like to offer up one more poll. Uh, really, would you like to be contacted by an ESRI expert? Um, this could be to discuss an upcoming project or even to troubleshoot some further questions. So just let us know. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. I'd like to personally thank our two guests, Mike and Eric, for taking part, uh, for taking the time to tell some really amazing stories. Uh, and we hope we, you've enjoyed the uh, topic today as much as we have. Uh, have a great rest of the week. Thanks.